Welcome back, my nomads. Welcome back to another big cast. I'm here with Zach again. What's going on, Zach? Hey, brother, how you doing? Chilling, man. Chilling. It's been a, it's been a good week, man. It's been a really good week, and uh, I think you know why. I think a lot yeah. of people know why. I think so. Why don't you want to, you know, preach to the world everything that's going on? One word, my friend. One compound word. Starfield. <laughs> Starfield, right. Starfield, Starfield. All day, every day. Take that, take that. Gotcha, gotcha. I will say all day, every day, because <laughs> I've already logged in 55 hours of it. Ooh. Jeez. I don't know if a lot of that is me keeping it on pause and me doing other stuff, if that counts that or not. True. It might. <laughs> but no, definitely. Uh, no, I was really excited. Like we've been talking about this game for a while, and that was one of my main things for you to get the X to begin with was this game, Ryan. And can you imagine playing it on anything else? Nah, nah, man. Uh, my X. I know it's a powerful game, but my X has been quiet as a mouse. Hearn. No, no issues. Yeah. No, it's been. I can tell sometimes if I have like multiple things open, like it will like freeze for a little bit, like other applications and I have to close them. But other than that, no issues at all. Like I, Phil Spencer did the right thing by pushing this game back as much as he did with very little bugs, which is great, you know, and now they can just really work on the optimization of it and all that. So, you know, this is actually the first game got in how long a, very highly anticipated game without very few hiccups in launching it. Yeah, man. Um, Bethesda has been known to be the the glitchy, um, glitchy game house, but no longer, man. I mean, there are still a little hiccups, but n- nothing really major like in the past. Um, it's a great game. Uh, so much so that uh, a lot of Sony people are petitioning before it even came out. They were petition petitioning it to be on uh the Sony system. I'm like, come on, guys, you don't already have enough exclusives. Um, even the director of uh God of War Two, David Jeff, he was like, look, if you're if you don't have the console, just sign up for uh. Xbox Game Pass on PC and you can just get it and you should because it's it's an amazing game. And I agree. It, it's great. Yes. I logged in a lot of hours. I mean, for me it's a lot of hours. It's 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 a minuscule compared to you. Well, it's because yeah. I got a lot more discretionary time right now, right? But I mean I can do a lot of things at once, kind of play and you know, take a break and work and all that stuff too, right? So it's just I really wanted to get into it right before people started telling about the story because I know it's one of those things where there would be massive spoilers and I really just wanted to feel how it was going to be right and I didn't want to be like left behind like a month after oh man like how come I didn't do that you know and then we've been kind of talking about it like you definitely want to do the main story first I don't know how far along you are. Well, I I just took a break. I I just got the artifact from um, Aquila City. Took a break to go and get the Mantis, which I finally did. Got the Mantis ship, the weapons, all that. And I just fast traveled back to the lodge and dropped it off. And then it started to storm. So I turned it off and now we're here. But yeah, man, it's 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 a great game. I love it. It reminds me of like... Wait till you get closer to the end because... The end of the storyline is not the end. It is very fascinating how it works. <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's awesome. It reminds me of like the Foundation TV show mixed in with the Chronicles of Riddick universe, you know, kind of space sci-fi thing. And it's huge. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. I say, what do you think of, about a lot of all the people complaining about how empty? spaces in the game well i mean space is empty (laughs) i don't know how else to really put it for you people you know like 
there's only so much we can do. Like, let's just say we started colonizing today, right? You know how long it'll take to like, just set that up. Like you have to have some kind of realistic expectations for this type of thing. Like this isn't so far in the future where we're like, you know, so far around in the galaxy. Like this is just like a small part, right? And yeah, I think it it's like 2300 or something. Yeah, 2300, right, exactly. And I think where it's at, if you have over a thousand planets, you can roam and moons and all that stuff to roam. Like, what's wrong with that? I mean, that's people more are going to complain. Don't you think? I mean, you can't please everybody, man. They they make this amazing, massive game, and people are complaining. I mean, they built a game where it'll literally generate planets and stuff for you. See, the people who so are saying it, that space is too empty. They need to finish playing the main story and then it changes and it doesn't even matter. I mean, there's so much to do. How can you complain that it's empty? I understand you want to go and explore and stuff, but there's so many factions. Like you just, you're driving around your ship. You meet up with people. They hail you. They attack you, whatever. And there's certain systems you can't ever go to until you level up enough to. Exactly. And some that you can go to, but they're so high in level. It's like, oh, you might want to be careful. Like, I don't understand. I feel like, I f- honestly, I feel like you can hate me if you want. People who say stuff like that, I'm like, you need to do something else with your life. Because like, if you're already that far in the game, there's so much stuff in the game, period. In all Bethesda games. We talked about right. this. You, you know, they're they're known for not necessarily giving you the most cinematic stuff, but they're, they give you universes in their games. I'm like, if you have that much time, maybe you should be doing something else. Unless your your job is to play games. I understand that. But if you're just a gamer and you're doing that, I'm like, you might want to find something else. Maybe join a gym. You know, maybe maybe start a relationship with somebody. I don't know. You know, maybe get a maybe get a, a higher position at your job or a better job. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't know. No, I think there's way like more than enough plans, to do. Man. They didn't have enough stuff on it. I could definitely see myself putting a thousand hours into this easy. Same, man. I feel like I'm going to do... Uh, I'm going to use this game the same way I used Assassin's Creed Origins. I'm just going to milk this game for like three years. <laughs> I don't think you have to milk this. There's too much content for it to, for you to milk. You know, like you don't have to even find ways to stretch it out because... Yeah, true. It there's there's a lot to it, right? And uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of funny because I'm I'm just curious, like, okay, so we finally get what you want. You get a game with very little bugs. Then people complain about, oh, I shouldn't have taken this song. It's like, yeah, but you didn't want bugs, so this is what you get. You know, like there's a you know there's a compromise that has to be made with something like this. Like when you have something this big, it's inevitable you're going to run into something. It's going to cause issues. It reminds me of the triangle, the production triangle. At the top, you got good. At the left, you got fast. At the right, you got cheap. You can only have two. You can't have all three. So if you want it fast and good, it's not going to be cheap. If you want it good and cheap, it's not going to be fast. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you got to pick, you got to pick your poison. You got to pick your poison. So... If you want it fast and cheap, it's not going to be good. You know, look at all the video games that have come out lately. You know, there's just buggy messes. They're empty. Not much to do. They're, ser- they're live service games. It's it's just been a mess for the past few years. This is probably like the first good, complete game in a long time. You know, I might be wrong. I'm not much of a gamer. But I'm for me, this is probably the first game. I was like, yo, this is going to be good. All the other games, I was like, that that's going to be good. And then towards the time it was to come out, I was like, nah, I'm not going to get it. But this is the first yeah. one that yeah. is actually good. And I got it early access. And I was like, yo, this is this is awesome. Have what is, um, I mean, I feel like sci-fi is just continuing to pave the path of most popular genre, huh? Yeah, man. I mean, a lot of people are trying to... Um, Especially in Hollywood, uh, they're trying to still clip at the heels of Game of Thrones, but sci-fi is where it's at, man. I mean, did you see the Rebel Moon trailer? 
Yes. Bro. Bro. <laughs> Zack Snyder's doing sci-fi, man. And you know, you know, Rebel Moon was his pitch to uh, Lucasfilm for Star Wars. They denied it because he was like, look, my idea for Star Wars is going to be bloody. It's going to be rated R. They immediately kicked him out of the room, right? <laughs> so he said, you know, instead of killing this project, I'm going to retailer it to my own creation. And I'm so glad he did that because it looks amazing. Well, this is that's not the type of thing you would want to do for Star Wars anyway. Star Wars doesn't isn't that's not what its demographic is for. Like when you get it all messy and bloody, like that's not it's not Star that's not how it works. You know, what I, I even mean? feel like Andor is not what Star Wars is, but I'm glad it was made, and I'm yes. so surprised it was made yes. with how Lucasfilm is just a cluster f. I'm like so surprised something like Andor came out of that that rabbit hole that that shithole <laughs> that is lucasfilm <laughs> i'm so glad and i mean even with it's human movie, element dude that's all it is that's what makes it so good it's like you know we've kind of talked about this and oh, yeah. i feel like if you have any kind of human element to it drop some any kind of human element to it um people are going to be naturally gravitated towards it you know the human element i mean like look at other Star Wars stuff hasn't had that in there. It really hasn't. Bro, story over spectacle. We just talked about this. We just talked about this not too long ago when it came to Avatar. You know, we're we're going to talk about the movie Arrival today. Still holds up to this day, 2016. Um, why can we still remember a film like Arrival? But after you leave the theater with a film like avatar no offense to james cameron but his movies aren't memorable why is that well avatar's not memorable his movies are memorable i mean terminator is memorable terminator is memorable terminator 2 is memorable and why he didn't do three no he didn't do three no three doesn't exist (laughs) nothing exists after two let's be honest (laughs) he lost some of the rights to his ex, and that's why all these other movies were created. Da, da, da. So, why is it that all these other movies, like Terminator 2, Arrival, why are these other sci-fi movies are sticking to you like glue, but some of the most biggest sci-fi box office hits, Avatar, Avatar 2, why don't they stick to you? Because there's too much going on. There's too much going on. There's too many story arches. Like he has his entire family, each with their individual plot, plus the overarching plot, right? Which all comes together nicely. But you see, there's a lot of gray areas. Like, dude, it's a three and a half hour movie. And you're like, okay, I remember the end. I remember why. But there's very few scenes that like stick to me. Like, oh, that was a great scene. Bro, it's like story over spectacle. We always come back to this, man. Like, when you look at like Arrival or you look at um Terminator 2, the story is solid. If you take away all the sci-fi, all the CGI, what do you get with Terminator 2? You still get a great story about a mother who's trying to protect her son, about her a son who's trying yeah, to understand. Yeah, there's not much else going on. Yeah, like it's just about that. a son who's just trying to it. understand his place in this world, in the future, in the present, looking for a fa- father figure who he finds and this guy who was supposed to kill him but was programmed to help him you know there's there's meat to it you know with avatar these avatar movies there's no meat to the story it's just spectacle spectacle and it's great it's it's awesome you know it's the great for what for it themselves. is it's a great for what it is like it's a great story thing but in terms of dissecting it for individual like plot and stuff like it's okay like but we've talked about it and we broke it down it's very simple and that's okay Exactly. That's okay for what it is. It, it's okay, but once you leave the theater, it's like, what happened? Who who said what? I, I, it's like Oppenheimer. You look at Oppenheimer, it's just people talking for three hours, like Logan Paul said, whatever. But it sticks with you because the story is so solid. 
it's the compelling. editing and everything it, it's compelling how can a three-hour movie of people just talking no action because christopher be nolan made it very clear with how he wanted to film it with like the black and white and the color and all that like he made sure you remembered where where everything was at the way That's you're describing why. is a man creating a story not spectacle he literally was like, we're not doing the CGI thing, whatever. We're doing analog. You know, of course, there were some compositors he didn't give credit, credit to, you know, but it's um he concentrated on the story. And that's the problem with all these films nowadays. There's too much spectacle, spectacle, not enough story, you know, and there's people talking about, oh, is, is Oppenheimer going to be eligible for an Oscar despite the... um because of the diversity rules in um in Hollywood right now I'm like yes it will be if you look at the div diversity rules pretty much every production qualifies you know but here's the issue with the cast with that before we move on we're talking about the 30s and 40s how many ethnic minority people were working on the project well, Zach, you're talking about people who are ignorant, who don't know the um, the uh, diversity rules that every production has to go by. I myself was ignorant until recently, until I looked them up. There's three rules. Like you have to be, it's like less than thirty percent of your of your demographic has to be diverse, and it has to be diverse with a non-majority people, basically a minority, which is women. Uh, LGBTQ. Um, what if it's an all race? black cast? Would that count? Or yes, since there's a majority and you would need to have like 30% white? Yes, because it doesn't count cast only. You have to, there's three things. It's either cast. Well, production in general. You get what I'm saying? Let's just say Jordan Peele, who's all about the black for everything, right? right? In terms mm -hmm. of, which is great because he empowers people who really didn't get representation in a lot of different, you know, roles. So let's just say he went with everyone who's black. So he would need to have 30% white then, right? Or is that well, only less work than with... Well, you get what I'm saying. I'm just using yeah, that yeah. as just for round numbers. There's three categories they need. you need to fill out on your production. Either your cast, your crew, or your producing executive team, whatever. So basically, you know, as long as you have a woman, LGBTQ or whatever, and one, you only have to qualify for one of those things. So right. either it's your cast, your crew, or your executives. And pretty much any production, it's, these rules are very, very lenient. So for all those people who are like, oh, you know, Oppenheimer's not going to qualify. It will. All right. It will. Because I'm sure they had a black camera operator or a black executive or an LGBTQ. Matt Mickelson just went through this too. So he just finished up a movie about uh, Denmark in 1775 and he was doing a press conference in in Denmark about it. Mm -hmm. And someone asked him, like, you know, you guys are getting some scrutiny about not having a diverse cast. Everyone's white. And he laughs. He was like, and the director chimed in. He was like, you understand this is Denmark in 1775, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I was like, he was like, I don't remember seeing, I don't think there was a lot of, a lot of minorities running around Denmark 1775. It's like, that's true. Cause there's not a lot of minorities running around in Denmark now. So but I'm sure I mean, they had plenty of minorities. Minority just doesn't mean black. There's also, you know, Hispanics, blah, 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 you know, but women. You know what I'm saying? Like for the cast in particular, like if you're going to get heat for that, like, come on guys, like 1775, let's be And real, whoever right? said that, whoever, that whatever reporter said that, is ignorant because your crew has to can qualify that and there's so much crew there's there's the lighting department the costumes the storyboard he was just, they were just fixated on the cast that was it because people are ignorant <laughs> they just don't know people are ignorant they don't know what they're talking about. I, I watched a clip this morning it was very funny to me of all the things that you got to ask him this is what you're asking him can't ask him about the movie how it went all that stuff you know exactly and it's dumb and then if you did have somebody in there who was, let's just say, black, because, you know, we talked about it before, black is very visceral. That's why it's always being used. If we have somebody black in there in Denmark, we'd be like, uh, what's going on? You know, that's why. Yeah, how did this happen? The, did you see the live action casting for um, How to Train Your Dragon? No. So the, the, the chick is um, biracial. 
No. The same... But it's taken place in Nordic or like Scotland or something, right? Isn't it like Norway or like the British Isles or Bro, they don't care. The chick who played um I think her name is Sarah in The Last of Us uh live action, the daughter. She's playing oh, the uh, girl. Okay. And people are like, what's going on? I I I don't know, bro. <laughs> I don't know. I first of all, the How to Train Your Dragon movies are awesome. I don't see why you need a live action you don't. adaptation. Because you can't create the same kind of chemistry that dragon and the main character has especially when the dragon's supposed to be like cute so to speak and have that moment like you can't do that with a real dragon thank you there's all these live action adaptations and disney is because they can't think of anything original anymore there's nothing there's some things that don't translate in live action that you can do in animation that you can't do in live action and sometimes that animated feature you like it so much because of the look of it because of the style of the animation so to do it in live action is just going to bastardize it. And it, I, I feel like it's going to be like that with the Avatar The Last Airbender live action adaptation, you know, this How to Train Your Dragon adaptation. They're, they're even, Disney's even doing a Moana adaptation. Moana just came out a couple years ago. Why are you doing it live action? A Lilo and Stitch live action? Like, there's, it's not going to translate. It's just not. <laughs> Especially because Disney doesn't know how to adapt Ad- adapt things to live action we've seen it they don't know how to do it they don't know how to transition to it some some studios have Being done the it beast was like the only one i think was okay and it was kind of boring yo it was boring because <laughs> i mean it was boring you have these princesses you need to have like extremely attractive like people like conveying it and if you have emma watson like come on well that's not the case the problem is they they when, when they Disney ad- adapts them. They make them longer, and there's not much Doesn't meat. Need to be. meat. <laughs> yeah, they, there's, there's not much meat in the original story anyway. But they make no, them longer without doesn't adding need to anything. Be. It doesn't just. They don't know. Everyone. But but let's get to um, why we're here. Arrival. Something that's actually good. <laughs> something that actually deserves our time to talk about. You know, something that's good to talk about after talking about a horrible movie called The Happening. <laughs> but it was memorable. It was Tell memorable. me how it wasn't memorable. It was memorable because it was so bad. It was so bad it was good. But did the job but they do it they did its job though, right? You remember it. We're talking about it. Yeah, I guess if you wanna if you wanna stretch it out that way. You know? <laughs> but arrival, man. I mean this is a movie that every time it comes on streaming services, I gotta catch it. It's funny that you text me. It was like, yo, you got to watch it. And I was like, bro, I've seen it a thousand times. I'm going to see it another time, bro. I've, uh, the first time I saw it was the other day. Really? Bro. I'm surprised I never told you about that. Mm-mm. It's great, man. And by one of my favorite directors, Denis Villeneuve. I love this guy. The director of um, Doom, Blade Runner 2049, Prisoners. You know, Dune's okay. I mean, Dune's a very tough remake to do because the books are very loaded. But the um, I think he pulled it off. Well. The David Lynch one, though. Oh God, I've seen clips. It's like bad, bad <sighs> shit crazy, man. Well, that's just how they are, right? Like Dennis, he David Lynch is like one of those directors in like the eighties and stuff. Like people who were in that pseudo elite like intellectual space like oh have you seen this movie it's by david lynch and you're like i don't understand it's like well i did it's supposed to put you in like a whole nother space of of that but all of his all of his stuff doesn't make sense yeah yeah Mm -hmm. tell me how any none of them make sense like dune's based on a book right and Mm -hmm. that movie didn't make sense i'm like you're following the book the book's not that hard to understand (laughs) i mean it's so it's it's so comprehensible that uh, George Lucas basically just pulled everything from it and added oh. Jedi. <laughs> so it's so does Villeneuve just he just concentrate on sci fi? Is that his? Is no, that his thing? I mean, not really. Because if you look where he started out, like um, 
I don't know much about him. I know he did Dune. Cesario. Sicario. Sicario. He did Sicario. He did Sicario. He did um, Prisoners with a Hugh Jackman and Terrence Howard. Okay, Ray I've movie. seen that too. And Jake Gyllenhaal. Great movie. He did this movie with um, Jake Gyllenhaal too called I always mix up these titles. It's either Double or Enemy. And it's great. It's about how Jake Gyllenhaal's character just meets his his doppelganger one day. Oops. And he's just so like visceral. And actually Arrival reminds me of that with the creep well, I don't want to say too much, but with the creatures. We so didn't it, say too much. The movie's what, five years old? <laughs> no, I meant for uh enemy or double if anybody wants to see it. But um yeah, it's it's um I don't know. I know for him, Dune and Blade Runner twenty forty nine were like projects he was like, I gotta do. Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies. So underrated. I don't know why people hate Wait, which one are you talking about? Blade Runner or 2049? Both of both of them. Yeah. But I love I love both Blade Runner in general. But twenty forty nine is great. one of those few movies where they pick it up like, you know, as a sequel like forty years later and does a very good job. Like Yes. And then people called it boring or whatever. I'm like people just want explosions and stuff. But I feel like twenty forty nine over the years has just gotten better because people are like rewatching it and they're like, yo, this is great. This is amazing. You know, a lot of people rewatched it, um, or watched it for the first time before Dune came out, and they were talking about, "Oh, this is great! This is the reason why Dune's going to be great." Ridley Scott did the first one, right? Yep. Yep. He okay. First, he he produced the second one for Denis too. Well, he did a good. He I'm glad he allowed to have Villeneuve like pass the mantle to him and do it because his movies have fallen flat lately, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> But no, but you see something like I, I kind of see a very similar way now that you kind of like since we're kind of talking about him, his movies all have a very similar feel to it. It's very familiar. You know what it's I mean? Very like he he knows how to direct mood and tension, and like he doesn't need a whole lot of exposition in his scenes. He'll sometimes just convey an emotion with the blocking of the characters, how they're moving or how the camera's moving with them. Like, a lot of his films just breathe. You know, sometimes directors, when they get big blockbuster chances, they feel like they got to have all this stuff happening on screen and blah, 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 blah. No, you don't need all that. No, you don't need all that. And a lot of times his films just breathe. And, um, you know, fun fact, since we were talking about diversity, <laughs> the cinematographer for this movie, the black man, Bradford Young, you know, he became the first African American to be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Cinematography. So there you go, people. There you go. But I thought the cinematography was great. Nice. Him and the uh, him and Young were talking about how they were trying to go for like a dirty sci fi look, and I feel like that's Denis Villeneuve's like look now. I think Arrival is his first sci fi movie because after this movie, he started right away working. No, because Blade Runner, Runner came out before that. No, no, no. Arrival came out before. Because as soon what as year did Arrival come out? 2016. Oh, okay, yeah. Because Blade Runner was literally like the next year. Yeah. He started working right after this. He, with no breaks, he started working on um, Blade Runner after this. And uh, I feel like that's been his look for all his projects. Just like dirty sci-fi. Gritty, dirty sci-fi. And I'm here for it. It looks great. You know, and... Um, Without showing the alien really ever. Yeah, you see it, but it's like in in the rifle, like you see it, but not like detail. Yeah, it's I it's dope. I like the um I like the look of the aliens, like how you know the bottom half you see the you see the bottom half of them for most of the movie, and they look like they kind of look like octopi, but like their tentacles look like fingers, like it's kind of creepy, but at the same time they're not there for ill content they're there to actually help humanity because they need humanity's help 3000 years from uh that moment and i i thought i thought it was great um the movie is based off of a short story by ted chiang and um he he loved the movie he said the script was a one of the greatest adaptations he thought the movie was a great adaptation and i thought it was just like 
a crazy ass story to think about you know the idea that language is um a weapon I love that and we can see that now now nowadays with uh, you know social media and stuff like that you know companies are making huge decisions based on the language that happens on their social media platforms but i just like how they showed how complex language can be you know there's this cool uh part in the movie where she's getting pushed back from the main character is getting pushed back from Forrest Whitaker's uh, soldier character. He's like, look, I don't know what you're doing, but you can't do it. She was like, look, I have to do it this way. Wasn't that Amy Adams? Amy Adams, yep. And she's like, look, she does a short explanation of like, you know, when the first people landed on Australia and they saw the The Aborigines and the they asked them, yo, what's that? And the Aboriginal said kangaroo and so they called that animal kangaroo years later they found out that but that was wasn't confused. the actual name they that confusion she, i mean she like, made it up but the point remains the same exactly the point remains the same and so i'm like oh that's that's a good way to like get your way across but also show how complex language is because yeah. here's the thing they obviously know they're more advanced than they are in terms of technology and understanding of all that stuff right but language can be you know, I conveyed and received in a completely different way that's nonverbal. And you have no understanding of that because, so if it's nonverbal, right, then at that point, they have to assume they're, it's like teaching a toddler how to speak at that point, because their way of communicating is not human. And she has to start from the ground up. That's a lot of work. And she even said that. Come to find out, it's not, it doesn't even work like that. I mean, they already understood them, you know, pretty quickly. She even said that in the movie. He was like, yo, we need to get to this question. Why are you doing all this basic stuff? She was like, yo, you want to know what is your purpose on earth? This is where you want to get to. She broke it down. And she was like, well, they need to know what purpose is. They need to know what intent means. They need to know. And you, because there's yeah, two different you. versions of you. Like yeah. you, you as a collective and you as an individual, and you have to establish individuality versus a collective. She was like, we even need to break down what a question is so they can understand what a question is and stuff like that. And like, and every how time... to answer it and what it, a question needs an answer. Yes. And how to actually answer that. And how to come to find out intent. the written language, come, come to find out the written language was so complex that they would take pictures of it. And there was years worth of data inside those ink blots. Yeah, it's crazy, you know, the director and the, I think it was a screenwriter or something like that, they made a whole, they called it a logogram, basically like a visual bible of the language of the heptapods, and it had like so many characters and what each meant and everything like that, and I thought the um, the language was a great way to convey how the heptapods um, perceive time. You know, there's no beginning or end. It's just a circle. Kind of like, um, like, like I have a tattoo. My tattoo is a Celtic knot. And the idea of a Celtic knot is that there's no beginning or end. That's why it's, you can't find one. It's just continuate. And that's how the heptopods perceive time. That's how they speak in their language. Well, they don't really speak in their language. It's just conveyed in shapes that have no beginning or end. And I thought it was a cool way to show, like, oh, this is how they speak. And it was, like, very, very complex. Just, like, little shapes meant, like, a whole thing. But they like can get really... so much information in one sitting so quickly. Yes. That's and how advanced huge. they are. They can do literally months' worth of communication in, like, a second. Yep. And it speaks to how advanced they are. You know, like, we talked about this before with sci-fi. Like, if we ever were to travel faster than light or whatever it won't be with our like primitive technology with fuel and jet engines and stuff like that you know you play these video games like starfield where they're still using the same technology that we use today it's like nah that wouldn't be the case you see the aliens they're using technology that's way beyond anything that we can even comprehend you know they don't have jet fuel they don't have fire it's just like their ships are just levitating above everything and they just disappear into the atmosphere and stuff. I mean, we were just speaking on that. I mean, I think we were just talking about this the other day is like 
do you find it fascinating that Bethesda choice in terms of how to do faster than light travel was gravity based which is exactly what the government whistleblower talked about with the propulsion of the ufo recovery is the same thing it's like this is weird because it's always been faster than light travel is like understanding how to actually like bend a understanding of how physics works to travel in that way right and there's a very different mechanisms if that's a wormhole any of that stuff but this is manipulating and creating gravity in the central area yeah and this is how a alleged way of how extraterrestrials do it too obviously we don't have an understanding of that because we didn't know like technology that humans understand and that public understands is that there's no way to manipulate gravity or create it it just exists and you have to deal with it yeah so it's what's up with that? How is that so spot on? Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. And even when in the game, when you travel, you know, you it kind of gives like a distortion, like it's op- like it's bending space and time as opposed to like other sci-fis where it's just like, poof, like a bullet of speed going by, you know, it's like oh, bending gravity tethers time. time in itself for you to travel. Yep. That's what it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? The constants, I mean, not even time's a constant because, you know, it, you can see like you can see how like modern sci-fi has definitely motivated like bethesda in terms of interstellar yeah like interstellar. it's kind of crazy how chris nolan was so educated and how he put a lot of details into stuff right very well, little things he wanted to get it right so he asked for a lot of help from um... black holes like no one even knew what a black hole looked like right and he did a simulated version of the black hole come to find out it was like 99.5% accurate of what a picture of a black hole when it actually came out like three months ago. That's fascinating. That movie came out 10 years ago. You know how they did it? Math. They went to um, mathematicians and they had to take the math that the mathematicians did and put it in the computer because it was too much for a computer to render out 3D wise um, in real time. So they had to put the math in and then they just had to put it to render and hope that it looked right. So it was all just numbers, ones and zeros. Same thing they same thing they did in the first Tron movie because technology wasn't where it is now. Yeah, so they just but, had I to mean, do but it it's fascinating, math. right? Like black holes exist, right? And then we mm-hmm. see this picture of a black hole and you see that the math is correct. And you're like, you know, math is really the basis of how math is a universal concept. And every race has to, every existence of a being outside of us has to have a basic core understanding of how math is. However you get there, however it is displayed in your language, it is the concepts the same, right? And when when um, Jeremy Renner was like talking, was like, have you spoken to in like some kind of math way, like Fibonacci, like, you know, certain equations, and there hasn't been any of that yet. Like, you know, it's kind of funny he asked that because I'm sure there's, Definitely, that's probably the one similarity that every space-bearing civilization would have, would be that. Right. Yeah, and it's like, um, I mean, back to circle back to Oppenheimer, you know, back then technology wasn't what it is now. So what did they have to rely on for all their theories? Just math, 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 math. And Oppenheimer himself would say, he's like, I'm not as good with the math as most of my people. So he would just give the math. I have a theory. I want you to do the math to see if it will work, you know? So it all goes back to math, you know? And I mean, it's interesting too, because in the movie, like we were talking about technology, you know, their technology is way, way above and the the hectopods, their technology is way above what we have. And you see when they're, they have the symbols when they're, quote unquote speaking for their language, you know, um all the tools that the the people were using were like math equations mapping out like the very even the smallest slither in their symbols of what they were saying or speaking in their language. And it was kind of cool how it would show like, oh, these guys are just using algorithms. And they're just and then they have like an algorithmic generator for when they were trying to speak to the hectopods it was like oh this symbol stands for earth this symbol stands for human let me type this in and then you would see in the computer it would like 
form something, it would be like, oh, it's ready, and put the symbol up there. You know, everything pertains to math. It goes right back to math. And, you know, they say that music is like a uh, different, it's, it's like a universal language. And if you look at music, it, all music is, is just math. I don't know if you ever learned an instrument or any anybody out there has. I play but... piano, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah, it's just math, four sixteenths. You know, it's just it's just math and it's an equation. And even the music in here, which was done by the late Johan Johansson, a uh, frequent collaborator of Denis Villeneuve, but he died recently. He um he did the music as a palindrome, a palindrome which is like um like the name Hannah, the daughter in here. Yeah, There's first no and last, yeah, like a race car. Yeah, he he um he did the music like that to convey the same thing in the movie and stuff. Like the little girl's name is Hannah. It's a palindrome. It's the same forwards and backwards, you know. So it was it was interesting to see how they um they really they really crafted this movie. You know what I'm saying? Like some of these movies that stick with you you see how like the directors every department the directors the writers the composers you know everybody crafted everything as opposed to a lot of these movies now you know that come out and they're just like we did this and we decided to change this last minute that's why the cgi looks like crap <laughs> the flash <clears throat> but you know even though it was being made for like 10 years like a lot of these so movies. let's let's so let's so let's kind of like go back a few steps, right? Mm -hmm. 70, 80 years ago, when you're having works of Orson Welles, Jules Verne, um, H.G. Wells, mm -hmm. you know, um, Isaac Asimov, like you know, mm -hmm. these guys really didn't have like it was not a very popular genre, even by reading, right? True, true, you know. I mean, really, you can you could probably make the argument that, you know, Isaac Asimov is like the godfather of like science fiction, especially in terms of laws of robotics. Oh, yeah. How robots are seen and perceived. Um, Was it the three rules of robotics or something like that? Yeah, the three. Yeah. The laws of robotics. Yeah. I mean, H.G. Wells, probably he wrote the first science fiction novel, I think, ever. Like he was the one that created the. And then um, Orson Welles or was it, no, it was Jules Verne that did it? I think Jules Verne was the one that did it. H.G. Mm -hmm. Wells made it more of a mainstay, I guess. It started gaining popularity within. Then you had Isaac Asimov around the same time, all that mm -hmm. stuff, right? And now you see it for what it is now, and you're like, dang, you know, like, <laughs> what happens? Like, kind of walk me through. Like, Star Trek kind of had a following in the 60s, but it didn't. It kind of fell off, right? Mm -hmm. And then it blew up after Next Gen. But I'm really going to give George Lucas a lot of love and credit here. He made it popular. Tell me I'm wrong. No, he's right. I mean, you're right. Um, I think he did a genius thing of K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. So what George Lucas did was take a space opera, what they called it back in the Soap day. opera. And he he made it simple by putting it a simple hero's journey into it and because you know at the time you know a lot of a lot of the movies that were popular were fantasy you know sword and shield conan the Bar barbarian stuff like that oh yeah definitely and if you look at star wars that's basically what it is but in space you know it was a genius idea to just keep it simple you know have the hero have the reluctant hero have the wise old man you know, have the rogue who you don't know if he's going to come back and help and save the day. You know, have the princess, you know, stuff like that, you know, and he kept it simple, basically. And then, you know, he he changed it on the way after its success. He changed it up. And let's not forget, you know, Star Wars was saved in the edit. You know, his friends helped him out. His very famous. Yeah, but that doesn't, stuff. you know, but, you can still give the man credit just because he yeah, had help. Yeah. Everyone who's successful has had help. It's just how yeah, it works. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he kept it simple. And now because of the, sim the simplicity of it, and now sci-fi is what it is because it blew up so far. And and besides, too, you know, before Star Wars, a lot of people didn't do space operas because it was kind of, like, corny. You know, the technology wasn't where it was. People didn't know how to do it. It was George Lucas's vision to create his own um, studio 
like a, his own VFX studio um, to make these. He they they were basically making the wheel while trying to figure out what the wheel was. And that's how ILM was born, Industrial Light and Magic, the the VF, the big VFX powerhouse that it is today. You know, doing all that, st- doing all those shots, analog, and you know, matte painting. That's his company. Yeah, yeah. That's that company. that's part of THQ, right? Like when he was doing that, THX. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. THX was a game changer. Yep. Yeah, I mean, George Lucas is a sci-fi game changer. You know, but and he, I mean, George he's Lucas, very wealthy because of it too. Yeah, without George Lucas, we wouldn't have <laughs> ILM. We wouldn't. We probably wouldn't have the technology we have now because. ILM uh, really propelled the industry after I kind of like what kind of like what Peter Jackson did with editing and mm-hmm. natural same thing you know what I mean yeah, George yeah, Lucas yeah. is to CGI as yeah. as you know Peter Jackson is to natural editing and you know doing more of the cinematography on a natural level yeah Peter Jackson the production of Lord of the Rings oh my gosh they and his they other brought movies back too majors. yeah yeah but Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings production really brought back the power of miniatures because they just ha- didn't have the technology to do environments and the compositing of the, the miniatures with the act. Like it was, it was amazing. Amazing. What was the district? What's that district 13 district nine district nine. I mean, he produced it, but I know his special effects company did yeah, it. He, uh, the director was Neil Blumkamp. Very good movie. Also One very the- underrated. Yes, one of those movies that um, I was watching a video essay about um, why are all these like these low budget these these great sci-fi movies and TV shows with low budgets doing so well while these big you couldn't tell it was low budget, but they did it because they limited how much Alien was in there. They picked their shots, my friend. And I think that was a purposeful reason more than anything. Like Peter Jackson movies all get money now. You know what I mean? So it's not really that. But I think it's really like, how much exposure do you want? Like, that's what M. Night Shyamalan did with Science, right? How much am I willing to actually show the audience this? Let let me get them captivated. Get them engrossed. So when I actually do the grand reveal, it's the most shocking and it still sticks to me. It's like the most horrifying and shocking thing you will ever see. Like, when you see the alien on the screen and signs, you're like, that's stuck with you, you know? Yo, for real. I still think about it to this day. I've only seen signs once or twice, and I still think about it. I could still vividly see One of the scene. greatest moments ever, I think, in, in movie history was just him freaking out. Like, dude, this, this thing that you never could perceive exists is on your television screen. <laughs> At the same yeah. time... You have Mel Gibson's character, or a little bit after, physically sees one himself. And you just see the so leg. Crazy. It's the best part. I gotta see that movie again. Shout out to M. Night Shyamalan. I know we we bagged on you last time, but you 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 do have great movies. And Signs is one of them. Like, I gotta see that again. It was so haunting. Like, he made a horror I mean, that's a sci-fi, like... but it's a thriller. But, I mean, that's... Yeah. It's stuff like that, like... Especially when you portray the alien as nefarious or I'm not going to say evil, but I guess, you know, they want to cause harm. They're malevolent instead of benevolent. You know, you want to limit that, right? Like you want to create that suspense and stuff and building it up was just so great. And I think, I I really hope, I don't, you don't really see that now because we have so much reliance on CGI. Bro, I just saw a couple weeks ago, the last voyage of the Demeter. The Dracula movie that came out, and uh, I actually liked it, but I felt like I was like, "Damn!" Because we have technology, people just show too much. They show Dracula too much. It's supposed to be a thriller, and um, I just thought about much. movies you just talked about, and I'm like, you know, because of the limitations, limitations breeds creativity. So back in the day, the thrillers and the horror movies Alien. were so much better, and that's the thing. The director of the Demeter movie. Was like, yo, I wanted to make a Dracula movie, but I wanted it to be aliens on the sea on a boat. And I was like, but you didn't really follow it because you kept showing Dracula. Like, even the commercials. I saw one commercial because you know I don't watch trailers. I watched one trailer, and I was like, yo, you show me too much of Dracula. Like, there's no mystery. You yes. Should, 
the last scene, spoiler alert, the last scene where he grabs the guy and he's about to kill him. And he's like, I'm not afraid of you. And Dracula's like, well, you should be or you're about to be. And it shows his face. That should have been the only time that you saw a full shot of Dracula. But they kept showing him before that point. They should have done the thing that they did in um, the Lord of the Rings, the first movie. When they showed Gollum, but they only showed him for a second. You saw this thin, gray, big-headed you man. You see a silhouette of him more than him. You see half his face or just his eye, right? And then you see his silhouette, and you hear him talk, and that's it. Or scream. And why did they do that? Because the technology create wasn't developed enough, so they had to be creative. Limitations breed creativity, and they should have done that in... I uh, feel like Alien yeah. was like that, too. That came out in 79. Same thing with Alien. They had to do that because of that reason. And I feel like the the problem is we don't have enough limitations anymore because of technology. So people just it's show just way a shoe too in, much. right? And you're wasting money. Mm -hmm. But then it, it just takes a great director to be like, look, even though we can show it, we shouldn't. That's what we need. We need we need people. But I understand. I understand. Sometimes you get studio interference, and the, stu the studio execs are like, look, we got to show him. We got to show him. We need a good trailer shot. You but know, he does see him. like. Villain with did that, you know, like, and he's done that in a few movies. Like, he's you had the ability to do that in Arrivals. You did that for a very specific reason to kind of mask what they look like ever. Mm -hmm. Even when you got a good look of them, you still didn't get a good look of them. Yeah, it was still pretty foggy. Um, and the Sam Worm in Doom twice. It's the only time you saw it, right? Yeah, and that's like the biggest part of like, you know, that's like the grandstanding thing in the whole Dune, right? And you, know, you did it like you should. You saw it twice, so it's... they built a trailer around it. <laughs> they built the Dune trailer around showing the worm, and I thought that was a mistake. But you know, these studios are like, "We got to sell the movie." Duh. I get it. I get it. I get it. But I mean, it, but the the worm itself wasn't part of the movie. No, it was at the end of the, that shot. Was the end of the movie too? <laughs> so it's like. You know, I guess you got to sell the movie, you know. I... Well, you got it halfway through, right? With Oscar Isaac's character and his son are going through and it's like eating up one of the crawlers, right? But but you still don't see the worm. You see the worm eating. You see like the teeth, like closing in. And I thought that was oh, a great shot. I thought shot. it popped out too. No, that's a different shot. It popped oh. out at the end of the movie. So it's okay. two different shots. The first shot is the Oscar Isaac one, which is a great shot. and It deserved to be in the trailer and it was in the trailer. And then at the end of the trailer, they showed the second shot at the I end. I feel like people gave out too much of their cards on trailers. Yes. The problem is the directors don't have any say with the trailers. They're, they're, they're outsourced to a third party, trailers are. There's companies that are specifically only for making trailers. And so it's just like uh, that movie, Terminator Genesis, where it was like... Um, it was revealed that John Connor was a robot. That was revealed in the trailer. <laughs> and the director freaked out when that trailer was released. He was like, you just gave away my whole movie. And guess what? No one saw the movie. <laughs> it did so bad in the box office. And you, you, can't, you can't blame the director. It was the trailer. I'm like, who? Why would you do that? You gave away his whole movie. And because of that, everybody was like, oh, he's a robot now, the savior? I'm not going to watch it. And no one did. It was a good movie. It was a decent movie. Decent movie, but no one saw it. That's the one with though. Christian Bale, right? No, 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 no. That's the one with uh, Amelia Clark as Sarah Connor. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And Jai okay. Courtney as uh, John Connor's dad. What was the one with Christian Bale? Which one was that? Uh, Terminator Extermination or something like that. That was with Sam Worthington too. That was okay. That was the director was MCG on that. Salvation. 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 Okay. Dude, there's a lot of people in here. It's you crazy because Bryce Dallas Howard. You had Anton Yelchin in it. Common was in there. Yep. I know how much you like Bryce Helen Dallas Bonner. Howard. Yeah, Helen Bonham Carter was, Bonner was in it too. Yeah. It was a stacked calf. Um, but uh, that movie, every time I watch the Terminator movies and they show you, like, the future where they're fighting the machines, I'm like, how how are humans surviving? Like, they're still using 
regular like M4 guns and like these <laughs> these uh <laughs> these robots have like these different types of robots that are like huge mechs and they have like laser weapons. I'm like, how are the humans still alive? Like I don't <laughs> it's so unbalanced. I don't get how they're still alive. But whatever, I don't know. But um yeah, arrival, bro. I mean, this is a sci-fi movie that are you a spoiler kind of guy? Like, would you be is so if let's just say you saw a trailer and you and it was spoiled, like would you be bothered by it? Yes, that's why I don't watch trailers anymore. I watch the first teaser trailer and then after I see the movie, I'll watch the rest of the trailers. Cause I do like trailers. I do I like making trailers myself. I like watching trailers, but trailers give too much away now. Too much. And I, I there's was AI a, programs that can like edit trailers. Just tell it the parameters, and it'll do it. <laughs> I do, I do commend people who make trailers that don't show anything. Like the Endgame trailer, you remember that? It showed you nothing, and they used outtakes instead of actual footage that was used in the movie. So I was like, that's that's genius. You didn't show me. You didn't reveal anything. Imagine the guys who had to do trailers for like porn movies. Like, how do you do? How they do even you pick make scenes? Trailers? I mean, that? I guess if you're it's a feature filter, a feature one, yeah. <laughs> That's got to be weird. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like you don't need to make a trailer for a porn. You could just put a synopsis up and people are like, oh, yeah, I'm going to watch that. <laughs> no trailer needed. <laughs> hey, man, you know. <laughs> the reveal is They're, the they're starving artists. I guess, man. I'm I'm pretty sure the the porn industry is pretty. It's thriving pretty well, you know. Especially now that there's OnlyFans out there. Yeah, uh, but you know, most of the internet's. I feel like. I just imagine just being. Let's just say, for all intents and purposes, like most of the visitors that come to us are nice versus hmm. evil versus bad, where they want to cause us harm, which I know that's not true. Um. And they just see this internet, this great thing we created, and like, what's on this internet? They're like, it's a lot of porn. <laughs> a lot of twerking. There's a lot of yeah. uh, bad news. There's a lot of stupid videos. A lot of porn. It's like 70% of the internet's porn or something. 60 oh, some yeah. percent. That's yeah, a lot of porn, dude. Wild. You have a lot of options. <laughs> and people got to pay for it. I don't understand. It's wild, bro. I mean, it, it's wild. I don't. Maybe that's why the aliens that do come here, they're like, I think I'm going to leave. <laughs> it's like, they're we're like, already we past, we're already travel. past the lustful part of needing to have, like, you know, relationships with anyone. Like, we're past that now because it just causes more harm than good. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Do you think Arrival, the story, not necessarily the movie, but you can say the movie, but the, the concept, the story of Arrival, do you think it deserves... A sequel. Are you intrigued if they were were to no. make a sequel? <laughs> I agree. I agree because why um, do we gotta do sequels? It's like Gladiator. Now a sequels popping up twenty five years later. Why? Uh, well, what are we doing? We're not even gonna talk about Ridley Scott and all the sequels he wants to bring. But uh, Ridley yeah, Scott man. is dying from dementia. I guarantee it. Bro, the first season, I've only seen the first season of Raised by Wolves, but that season is proof that he is. <laughs> that I watched both seasons because I was hoping it was going to get better, and it got crazy, and then it just got canceled because it was so expensive. And it was just, what? Like, what is going on? <laughs> it was like an acid trip. It's like, times I'm like, I didn't understand the plot. Like, what are we trying to do? Okay, you're trying to settle, then why are we having these issues? Bro. I'm still. There was no, there was no plot in the first season. No plot. Every time it seemed like there was a plot, it went left field to something else. It was and like, the caregiver what? was the, the 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 male robot, and the killer was the female robot, and they procreated digitally. But then what came out was a worm that could fly, and it was like what? <laughs> and people were probably like, "What are you talking about?" I was like, "That's how I felt watching that season." <laughs> I can never get that back. I was like, what? And I was like, oh, this could take an interesting turn. Expensive. No. <laughs> that show was expensive, too. That was an expensive mistake. Oh, yeah. It, it 
it made no sense. And I'm, I'm like, where are you guys going? I'm like, I feel like this show only was created because of Ridley Scott's name. That's it. I I feel like if anybody else went to that WB office and was like, I got an idea for a movie. Digital robot TV sex show. procreate. Oh yeah, for a TV show. Digital robot sex procreates a flying worm that is the savior of humanity. <laughs> or whatever. But they that created was. humans too. Out of it. She birthed humans. That's what all those kids were. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She carried them. She didn't create them. Right, right, right. She carried the embryo. Yeah, but <laughs> that that show. Oh my dear lord. Anybody else would have got turned down, but because he's really Scott, they was like, let's do it. You know, it's just like all those, what, Alien Covenant or something. What are those movies called that are supposed to be the prequels? Prometheus or whatever? Like That was with Idris Elba, though. So? <laughs> it was, that movie, Prometheus, had a stellar cast, Michael <laughs> Fassbender, Idris Elba. But it was like Numi Rapace. But it was like, What? Alien didn't need Michael prequel. Fassbender's getting canceled now. Why? I, don't know, I saw some article about how he's coming back from acting uh, from his hiatus, and uh, it's some assault, alleged assault from 15 years ago or something like that. Like now we're bringing this up. Like this guy's coming back in. Like this is what we're doing. Is this another situation <laughs> where someone's coming back, like James Gunn, and then they find something from 10 years ago that's not even really a thing? They get canceled, then they come back. We're like, we're sorry. You can create again. Like, come on, I, man. Oh, uh, yeah, ex-girlfriend doing it. Yeah. It was a week ago. From 2010. Like, come on, guys. 2000. You've had plenty of time. Like, it gets to a point, like, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, like, that whole, like, public thing. Like, regardless how you feel on it, like, there was enough substantial arguments to be made that she was making a lot of that stuff up and it's just like at a certain point it's like come on you know i've been a victim of abuse and stuff too it's like come on you know like it just happens and it's like you say something and, and like now we are like at a point where it's like it's an overcorrection it's like first off this dude hasn't even done anything in how long and he pops up and then you know and it's just like the time is how convenient the timing is it's like we don't even know which way is up anymore because it's just all these false flags. But then you get then you get Danny Masterson getting thirty years in prison for his rape stuff. I was like, damn, dude. But that was known for years. It was. That's why he. That's why he didn't finish the Netflix show The Ranch because of that. But that was known for a long time, even when he yeah. was doing the show, and they still dragged their feet on it, which. They they might have been I don't know I don't know the trial they might have been compiling evidence because um, thirty years is a long time dude for you know like people go for less for murdering someone. I mean I heard it was two women he he raped so no I I'm all about it you know like I think we I think when it comes to that stuff we don't put enough emphasis on putting longer dates on for that you know what I mean oh, but yeah. oh yeah and. I mean, like you said, we was hearing about that for years, even while he was still active in Hollywood. So it was like, I think this might have happened, bro. And then, you know, here we are today. It's like 30 to life. I'm like, Ooh, wow. So they got He's going to be an old right. man when he gets out. Oh, yeah. If he gets out. And it's like, they got that one right. But there's a lot of false flyers going on. So, you know, you don't know what to believe. I mean... Jonathan Major's uh, accuser fled the country, and now his trial is being delayed again. It's like, yo, come on, man. Come on. There's video evidence. There's there's witnesses, video, and audio that proves this man is innocent. And y'all still delay it. Like, come on. Throw this case out. The accuser left the country. As soon as they put out a warrant for her arrest, she left. I'm glad he's being treated okay by Disney, but Disney has done bad by others so quickly. I think they're trying to do right by him, which is why they're being quiet about it. Because they don't want another James Gunn, Gina Carano situation. Especially because Disney's not in the best Or Johnny Disney. Depp with Pirates. Oh yeah, I always forget. Or Justin Roiland with Rick and Morty. Same stuff, right? Because Disney owns Adult Swim. And Disney, like we said last time, 
Their stock is going way down because they keep putting out crap. So people don't like Disney right now. So they're they're being very, very careful. I mean, look at Ahsoka. Yeah. We people are like, oh my gosh, it's the best episode. The fourth episode is the best episode. I'm like, it's still subpar. Like <laughs> the, the episode What makes still, it subpar? The episode? The last no, one that came show. out? The show? Huh. Bro. Where what are do you at? what about the 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 the, the showing of from former master. What do you think of that? Spoiler alert. The last episode, she uh, supposedly dies. But she sees Eric, Anakin, right? When, when I died? watched that, supposedly. Oh. Supposedly. Oh, so, I see. I thought it was just, to me, I thought it was just she went into the same universe that Ezra was floating around in when he saved her from being fighting Darth Vader and when she did die and he saved her before she got killed. I thought yeah, it's, it's like a pocket kind of, of the universe that is where the whales travel. Universe. Yeah, it's like the Force, literally, or something like that. Yeah. But um, whatever. <laughs> um, you would think that I would be excited when I saw that. When I watched that, I thought to myself, I said, "Hmm, when is Disney going to make?" good shows that don't rely on cameos. Well, we knew Hayden show? Christensen was going to be in here, though. We knew it. I thought it was going to be flashbacks. We knew it, but I'm like, they He's do this all steps. the time. They dangle yeah. cameos in their Marvel and Disney shows instead of actually giving us good stories. You know, of, co- of course, there's exceptions, like the first season, first two seasons of Mandalorian um, and or you know, stuff like that, um, WandaVision. But for the most part, they just rely on cameos and even actor cameos. Like, did you see Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, Quantumanium with Bill Murray? They kept dangling the fact that he was in that movie and he was in the movie for like two minutes. <laughs> and he was, he was like... He was a big garage Dex. And he was a character no that. one knows anything about. Yeah, he's like, who's this guy? And when he showed up on scene, it was like, the music was all grand. It was like, it's Bill Murray. And then it was like, he's gone. <laughs> he's a no-name character you don't know about. And he's gone after two minutes. It's like, Disney continues to do this. And he did it in Ahsoka. And I'm like, you guys are killing me, man. You guys are killing me. Just make a good story. If you, yeah, if you, strip, so away, if you strip away the lightsabers, the, the ships, the force... At its core, do you have a good story and do you have a good script? If you don't, then don't make it. Just don't do it. Because you get this situation where Ahsoka is just not living up to expectations. Is this Filoni's fault? Could be. Or it could be the studio interference. Maybe Filoni doesn't know how to do live action stuff. Maybe the studio is interfered. I don't know because it, it, it boggles my mind, Zach. It boggles my mind that Dave Filoni made Clone Wars and Rebels, and we love those mo- those shows because of the characters. And then he makes live action versions of them, and they don't act like anything like their their animated counterparts. They seem like different characters. Sabine doesn't act like Sabine. Hera doesn't act like Hera. Ahsoka doesn't act like Ahsoka. It's like, what is going on? It doesn't make sense. It's further in time, so they've grown up. Things happen. So everybody's literally the same stoic character? The same stoic archetype? Literally? But that's how. But see, that's 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 Star Wars is mo, especially when you get older, right? Like, especially the ones who like push away of Jedi, and they're like, "Oh, I'll train you," and I'm not, and then they kind of turn into a recluse. Like, Hera and Sabine aren't Jedi, so, <laughs> bro. And you say this is what the Star Wars does? Is this what Star Wars did before Disney bought it or after? You feel me? For those listening, he's nodding his head yes. <laughs> so like, yeah. like, come on, bro. Like, this... It's killing me, man. I don't understand how Dave Filoni made this. Just like he made the animated shows, but they don't act like they're animated characters. And that's the whole reason we like those characters. They were good characters. But no one acts like how they act. And then ever since Disney bought Star Wars, have you noticed that no one dies by lightsaber stabbings anymore? You notice that? <laughs> Like, no one dies. Or they died before Biz- Disney okay. bought them. Oh, Han Solo did. Well, I feel like Han Solo was stabbed, right? And then he fell like a thousand feet. That's what killed him. Oh, jeez. 
I feel like they could have because Disney bought the rights and because it's a Disney product that he probably would have survived if he didn't fall. <laughs> that he fell a thousand. If he feet. wasn't falling in a volcano or whatever it was. But or, since... no, it was that chasm in the hangar is what it was. Yeah, yeah, that crazy and that's another thing about Star Wars. Like, it's like why, why do we have so these many big cabins? pits? <laughs> that's even before Disney bought Star Wars. They just had like, big pits. Big... <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I don't understand. Who designed it's like this a place? platforming video game. Like you're like, oh, well, if you fall, you die. I'm like, what's up with this? Why are we always like ten thousand feet above everything? I don't understand. I'm like, who designed? Who are these designers and architects that build these things? You should be fired. Oh my god! All this empty space and all these space boards. Yeah. Like, what's going on? But yeah, like Disney, Disney Star Wars is just stressing me out, bro. To the point that I'm like, just give it to Tony Gilroy. Just whatever Tony. Gilroy I don't think does. it's Filoni because you can see when Filoni does right stuff, right? Because he's done other live action and it puts it together nicely. And I just really think that Disney wants it done a certain way to keep their maintain their image. Tony. You may be right, bro, because like we said, Filoni created But Clone here's Wars. the thing. You know why I know that? Because look at Marvel. Mm-hmm. Marvel's being ran in a very specific way after huge success. You can see the stuff that's being put out now. You're like, eh. <laughs> yeah, you're like, eh. Eh. The fact that they're making a, a She-Hulk Are any of the two? shows any good? I mean, some of the shows are good, but most of them are bad. They're bad. They're bad. I mean, the only Ca- good Captain America and Winter Soldier was good. Falcon and Winter Soldier it was, was good. good. It was good. If it wasn't, if if the pandemic didn't happen, it would have been even better. But they had to chop it up because of pandemic. Yeah, but like but that was good. WandaVision was good. Uh, that was good. Loki was good. Loki, yes, was, Loki was fantastic. Loki was okay until the final episode, and it was like, yo, that was great. <laughs> like, that was great. Yes. Um. But um. I don't know, bro. Disney is just killing. Like they're making a She Hulk season two. Why are you doing that? Even even that show Echo. Why are you making that? Which is supposedly there's rumors that the show they finished making Echo the show. It's so bad that Disney doesn't know what to do with it. And I'm like, <sighs> who are they hiring? Are they hiring like kids who are like trying to compete for Doritos commercials, and they end up hiring them as directors for shows? Well, that was a big topic during the pandemic right was that there was this boom of streaming and all these platforms need content so people were getting hired that didn't have showrunner experience that didn't have producer experience that didn't have writer experience and some people got hired it shows. because, it because shows they were really, popular really... on social media and they had these agendas quote unquote that fit with the corporate view and so they got hired to write on these shows they got hired to produce these shows they got it hired shows to... so bad dude I'm telling and you. I feel like Disney hired the majority of those incompetent people, you know? And, I mean, look at... I'm going to say it. Look at She-Hulk, which clearly had an agenda, which clearly... Clearly. Yes. Didn't work. Clearly. No. Those agendas never work. And, uh... When you have to have, when you have to have a platform to, like, completely, you know put another group of whatever down in any kind of way, it never works because you're automatically alienating a group of people and then you're going to have another part. You're like, why are we doing this? So you're getting a very fraction amount of people who are like not even enjoying the content, but enjoying the fact that they are heard in some kind of way on a national level. It's just stupid anyway, but no, you're right. It's ruined Disney in so many different ways. We've talked about it with, um, Snow White and Rachel Zegler, Zegler, whatever her name is, and it's just it's it's starting to permeate in other media stuff now, and it sucks. It really does because they have so much good franchises, and I feel like they finally got in a good place where they have the right people with Star Wars, but now they're not even allowed to do what they should be doing because of that. You know, I agree with you. That's my conclusion. I don't think it's Dave Filoni or John Favreau's fault. I think it's studio no, because they've been proven time and time again they can do this stuff when they're left alone. I think it's studio interference. We've seen it with Mandalorian season three. Where everybody's like, "What happened with that?" Um, there's plenty Boba of Fett. reports of what happened. Boba Fett. Boba Fett. 
and man the last season of mandalorian there's there's plenty of reports of studio interference and there's rumors that john farrow's getting fed up so if he goes that's it i'm not watching bro i'm already like am i gonna watch the next uh marvel movie am i gonna watch the next star wars movie or star wars show i don't think so and i was on the fence about a film and uh the next marvel movie i think has come out is the first the two Marvels. were good and then it's just gotten kind of i don't know the first two what the first two were like good like good introduction and stuff and now all of a sudden it's like you're right about the characters like man this is not like rebels like this is like what makes the characters good what makes star wars good is character like development and their interactions and relationships with each other and there isn't any of that it's just so there's no relation i feel like everyone doesn't want to be in the same room with each other and it's like that's not fun that's so true and everybody there's so much of like someone asks a question or someone says something and then there's like dead silence and then someone answers and then someone will say some cryptic thing you like you feel like you're in like a like a therapist appointment and before we go, I got to get this off my chest. Another thing that bothers me about the show Ahsoka, everyone mm. seems so stupid. They make the dumbest decisions. First of all, in the first episode, the very first episode, the first thing that happens, a guy's like, oh, there's a Jedi ship approaching. Oh, there's no Jedi anymore. That doesn't make sense. We'll go meet them downstairs. What? <laughs> You're not going to put the whole ship on alert? You're not going to get the biggest security detail of all and guess what happens he dies he gets killed <laughs> and the two jedi well they're not jedi but they they the two whatever they are dark jedi or sith they go and they free the prisoner you moron and then in another episode they're in between because that's why their lightsabers are orange and red not just completely red it's yeah and then in another episode what happens um there's all this evidence that um the empire is flourishing in the darkness and what does the new council of the republic say no you can't go on that mission no they're, they're not a threat dude they just like killed a captain of a ship they killed a bunch of people on a ship and freed a prisoner and um before that scene it's shown that there's a bunch of empire loyalists that are and, working but you have to shipyard. build it to make the first order that's the thing right like that's what they're trying to but that's the problem with writing. I don't know who's writing these episodes. You gotta make it realistic. Way. Don't make it seem so <laughs> like, oh, they just don't care. It's like, you just got out of a war. Like, That's be what at least hesitant. Like, hey, I just don't want to cause another war. Like, it's not that big of a deal. We'll cross that bridge <laughs> when we get there. Say that at least. Thank you. At least say that. Don't sit there and say, no, nah, I don't see them as a threat. You're just making stuff up. Like, what? Yeah, I know. It's bad. Curious what people's thoughts are on that. And I'm a completionist, so it's hard for me to watch a show. And even though I don't like it, it's hard for me to stop. But yeah. I think Ahsoka Episode 4 might be my last episode. Mm. I think, bro. Because we'll it's just bad. Yeah. Hayden Christensen or not, it's just bad. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we were supposed to talk about the arrival, but once again, we did. We another... talked about it. It's so good. What a... we can't critique it, so it is what it is. That's true. It's another episode of us bashing Disney, but they deserve it, bro. And they have I the nerve like, to I, raise their prices I feel like again. That's a theme. I feel oh like my it's a theme. gosh, they're raising their prices again, despite all. Next this time, stuff. next time, next time we do this, I want you to finish Starfield's story, and then I want you to go into detail about how great finishing the main story. I'm using that air quotes. As you can tell, for anyone who's just listening, I yeah, want you to take on it. It's a pretty simple story, but it's still better than Ahsoka. Oh, just wait. Blows your mind when you finish it. Well, yeah. My nomads, this was another good one. You know, I hope you learn some stuff, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Disney, Disney is exhausting me. But, uh, be creative, my nomads. Peace. Peace.